And we are considering Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. And what we have here is the parable, the parable of the sower. So initially we have the parable, and then we have the interpretation. Jesus was teaching the people from a boat. He was on the lake, and he said, listen. It is so important to listen to the voice of the Lord. He then said, behold, or look. And it would have been a familiar sight to his listeners. A man had ploughed his field and was sowing his seed, sowing it, of course, by hand, to try and get an even spread of seed across the ploughed field. Some seed landed on a pathway that went through the field and just lay on the surface, no roots or shoots. They were consumed by birds. There was no harvest on the pathway. Other seed fell on stony ground with little depth of earth, the roots started to grow but were prevented by the rocks and so could not reach the moisture and nutrients. All energy went into the shoot, which would grow quickly and look like a good crop. But when the sun became hot, it withered and died. There was no harvest on the rocky ground. Some seed fell among weeds and thorns and started to grow. But before they could produce any fruit, the weeds choked the shoots and they became unfruitful. There was no harvest on the ground with thorns. Thankfully, some seed fell on good soil and sent down strong, long roots and produced good shoots, and there was a harvest, some 30, some 60, some a hundredfold. This was a simple, straightforward story to which the crowd listened. Later, the disciples asked about the parable, and so we come to the interpretation. The parable was essentially three components, the sower, the seed, and the soils. The sower, at that time Jesus was the sower, implanting the seeds of his message into the hearts of his hearers. After his ascension to heaven, the early disciples took to heart his commandment to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They became the sowers, and then every subsequent generation of Christian believers should be sowers of this great message to their community. This is done by example, the life and by exhortation, the lips, the seed. Clearly, the Lord says the seed is the word of God. It is a message anchored in God's book, the Holy Bible. The focus of that message is man's sin and need of a saviour. God in love provided a saviour in the person of his son, who died for sins on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day. All who believe in Christ with all their hearts will be saved. Christians should be sowing this seed, this message, by looking for God-given opportunities to share the message of the gospel. And so we come to the soils. There are four kinds of soil which represent the responses to the gospel. Firstly, the pathway. This was hardened ground and it meant that the seed did not sink into the soil, but birds ate it. People may hear the gospel message, but it goes in one ear and out the other as they instantly forget because they are hardened to the gospel. It is as if Satan has very quickly removed it from their minds. It has not had an impact upon them, and they are not blessed spiritually. The stony ground represents an emotional response to the gospel message. People may be moved by the message of loving sacrifice that sent us upon the work of Jesus on the cross. They appear to be eager, enthusiastic, and then it comes to an abrupt halt when they face mockery or persecution. The heat of persecution causes faith to fade because there was no deep root in their heart. And then the third is the ground with weeds and thorns. Here the response to the gospel is not so much emotional as cerebral. It is thought out. And some sort of commitment is made, but eventually the cares of the world, career, home, possessions, and the deceitfulness of riches, love of money, distract them from the gospel. These material things choke out the eternal thoughts of the gospel. And then fourthly, the good soil. Here the message goes deeply into the heart with a true root of faith. It produces the shoots of fruitfulness in the life of the believer, growing to be like Christ in character, showing the fruit of the Spirit and offering the fruit of their lips in thankfulness and praise. The challenge for us is which sort of soil are we? Verses 21 to 25 remind us that we should shine for Jesus. Here Jesus is saying that Christians cannot keep quiet about their faith. 
to hide their faith is not an option for Christians because they are lights for the gospel. They have truth and should demonstrate it. This challenge of Jesus may fill us with fear, and we might, as a consequence, be tempted to turn away from him. We may be inclined to keep our faith a secret, but Jesus refuses to allow us that option. The message divides into two sections, each commencing with the words, And he said unto them, verse 21-24. So the first is, Brighten up, verses 21-23. to Here the Lord gives an illustration and follows it up with an explanation. The illustration, candles or lamps were not lit to be put under a bowl or a bed. Instead, they were placed on a stand. To put the lighted flame under a measuring bowl would firstly plunge the room into darkness, and then the flame would go out. Everyone who heard these words of Jesus would have lighted a lamp or candle at night and knew that what he said was true, in a literal sense. Yet the purpose of the lamp was not to draw attention to itself. Today, when we flick a switch to turn on the lights, we don't spend time looking at the light bulbs. The purpose is for the light to drive away the darkness, enabling us to move around without fear and without confusion. So as Christians, we must let our lights shine, not to focus attention on ourselves, but on the Lord. A light is for illumination, to see things. Do people see the Lord in us, or would they be surprised, though we claim to be Christian believers? And so we come to the explanation in verses 22-23. Here Jesus refers back to verse 12 and reminds his listeners that his parables both reveal and conceal. Many people heard his stories, for example, about the sower, and never grasped their meaning. It had been hidden even from the disciples, but was disclosed or revealed to them later. It had been concealed, but was now brought out into the open. That had been illumination. The simple truth is that God's message is not intended to be hidden. It is to be broadcast, spoken about openly, and brought to people's attention. This truth can be seen as seed, which can produce fruit for God, or as light to dispel the darkness of sin, ignorance, and foolishness. Essentially, Jesus is saying that there is no such thing as secret discipleship. As we make known our faith, we may be mocked or persecuted, but it should not divert us from light shining. Jesus concludes this section by saying that we should listen, take his words to heart, and obey them. So brighten up and be a strong testimony of devotion to Jesus. And then verses 24 and 25 is listen up. Now Jesus says, consider carefully what you hear. It is too easy to let our minds drift and be distracted from important matters, focusing instead on the inconsequential and superficial. Jesus then says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Someone has called this a double law, the law of spiritual atrophy and the law of spiritual growth. Atrophy means wasting away, the opposite of healthy growth. If we listen to God's word and then do nothing with it, our spiritual lives will waste away. This reinforces the message contained in the parable of the sower. For growth, development and moving to Christian maturity, it requires listening attentively to God, not simply at church, but also in the quietness of our homes. We need to pray to the Lord and read his word every day, and then having gained understanding to obey it and genuinely seek God's help to put it into practice. It also requires us to share what we have gained from the Lord's word with others. So we need to listen up and truly take on board the word of God and live it out in absolute obedience in daily life. The chapter ends in verses 26 to 41 with seed and storm. Firstly, seed, verses 26 to 34. God's kingdom, says Jesus, is like a man who scatters seed on the ploughed field. This pictures the Christian who holds the seed of God's precious word and after prayer and preparation of heart spreads the message, either in written form or in verbal proclamation. The farmer continues his normal cycle of nighttime sleeping and waking up in the morning, but does not fully understand how the seed sprouts up and grows. We can imagine him in the fields and seeing the first shoots, and he would be greatly encouraged. In the soil and nutrients and moisture enabling the seed to produce a stalk which emerges above the ground. Then comes the head on the top of the stalk, which gives way to the kernel or ear of corn. All 
it requires of the farmer is to put in the sickle and harvest the right corn. The idea has to do with the work of evangelism, as Christians are meant to bring in a harvest of souls. Yet there is a mystery as to why and how the ground of the human heart is nurtured and softened to accept the seed, develop an interest in the gospel, and then come to the point of faith in Christ. There needs to be a great deal of discernment to recognise the work of God in leading someone to the Lord. Jesus then develops the idea of seed in the next parable, verses 30 to 34, and says that the kingdom of God can be compared with the smallest of all seeds, the mustard seed. It does not amount to much, but grows to become the largest of all garden plants and enable birds to perch in its shade. So the picture is from smallest to largest. The idea being that the gospel seed is small, seemingly insignificant, and seems destined to die and be of no consequence. Yet because it is the seed of God's word, it develops into a great tree, the church, with many people blessed by its presence. These are only samples of the parables which Jesus told as he spoke many similar parables, verse 33 says. At this stage in his ministry, he was a storyteller and did not say anything to them without using a parable, verse 34. This meant that most of his audience, while appreciating the parable, failed to understand the deeper meaning, but to the disciples he explained everything, verse 34. Then Jesus, who had been teaching the people in a boat, moved off with his disciples to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, but he soon fell asleep. And so he moved from seed to storm, verses 35 to 41. The boat was suddenly hit by a terrific storm. The winds blew and the water became choppy. It did not get better, but worse, and we can imagine the frantic work as the disciples tried to row to land. Even for some of those experienced fishermen, this was a storm of unusual intensity. The waves poured over the side, and water began to fill the boat, and there seemed no hope. They faced a watery death. This was a crisis, and they were rapidly moving from time to eternity. The cause of their deep anxiety was an unseen but powerful storm of wind. Many problems we face are so often disguised and unseen, but they can do immense damage. Ultimately, there is an invisible enemy of our souls who wants to destroy us. Like the disciples, we are powerless before this unseen destroyer. The only power greater than these invisible enemies is the Lord. The disciples had roused him with words of despair. Don't you care that we perish? And their anguished words must have pierced the heart of the Saviour because he really did care for them. Yet as they had struggled, he had quietly slept. As they toiled, he relaxed. They woke him and he did not join in their efforts. Jesus simply took command of nature and control of the world he had created. He re rebuked the wind and ordered the sea to be still and a beautiful calmness descended. Instead of noise and threat of death came quietness, peace, safety and life. With the blessing came a challenge, the question, why? Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Fear and faith do not coexist. As we trust Christ and keep our eyes upon him and our hearts centered upon his person, majesty and greatness, then fear is removed. The power of the Saviour induced an awed wonder and even fear in the disciples. They realised how insignificant they were before the one who could command the elements in such a way that the forces of nature obeyed him. When, like the disciples, we see the love and power of God, it is an awesome experience. God bless you.